There is not one square inch of this globe that does not cry out, I belong to Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray this morning, reign over us by your mercy and by your power. Lord God, we have sung this morning of you as our creator, the one who rules over mountains and oceans and deserts and tsunamis and droughts and floods. You are God of all the earth. And Lord, we're, we're so thankful this morning that in all of your power and in all of your authority, you are a God of justice and righteousness, a God of mercy, abounding in grace. And so, Lord, this morning, we, we join the psalmist in celebrating this great reality that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell in it. But who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who should come before this God? Holy, holy, holy is He. And yet you have made a way by the blood of Jesus that we can come into the presence of the Almighty with the affection of a child for a father. Oh Lord, thank You. And so Lord, this morning, these moments, again, we set our hearts and our minds to see your greatness and your majesty as the only sovereign king over all the earth. And yet we come as children. We need to be scooped up in your arms. We need to be loved and held by you. We need to be comforted. We need to be assured that you are indeed in control. And you will work all things out together for the good of those who love you and those who are called according to your purpose. We may see it in this life. We may not see it until eternity. But your purposes will not be thwarted. And so, Father, we pray this morning. We pray for the, um, the church in Mali. and Their need to encourage one another as they're suffering under is Islamic pressure as a church. Father, we pray, come to their aid. Remind them this morning that those who give real threats and who seem so powerful are not as powerful as they seem before the God of heaven. Give them confidence in your powerful and yet sometimes subtle hand at work in the midst of our sufferings. Father, we pray for the Kwa in China who do not know the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they need someone to go to them, to open to them the truth of the gospel. Oh Lord, we pray by your providence, by your hand, Lord, you can raise up any person from anywhere on this globe and you can empower them and enable them to go. So Father, we, we ask you to do that today. And Lord, we recognize we come with many challenges, many weaknesses in our lives. And I pray specifically, Lord, for our brother Chris Callahan as he's recovering from surgery this morning. Um, we pray for Trent Anderson's mom who is in surgery this morning. Father, we pray have special mercy on these dear friends and members of our family. Lord God, would you just bring healing and recovery and restoration May your grace be evident in their lives through their, the recovery process, not only in their bodies, but in their minds and their souls as they see the kindness of God unfold in their lives. Father, there are many others in our body who are recovering from many ailments. Those who are walking through relational difficulties right now. Those who are struggling financially. But Lord, we, we pause this morning to just acknowledge there's not a trouble or a care in this world you are not able to meet. We thank you this morning, Father, that your arms are open to us. And so, Lord, in as much as your arms are open to us, I pray, help us now to open our, our hearts to you, to receive from your word and from your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Esther this morning. We're in Esther chapter 1, and if you're not exactly sure where to find Esther in your Bible, if you open to the middle, you'll be about in the book of Psalms, and right before that is Job, and the book before Job is Esther. And so I invite you to join me in Esther chapter 1 this morning. I have the distinct uh, privilege of preaching in this new series from a new ESV study, new ESV Bible. I'm preaching the ESV this morning. Uh, from a new pulpit. In, do, you, do you like our new pulpit? Isn't that great? It's beautiful. So thankful. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, um, that the, the uh, stainless steel spiral coming up, does it not look like there's something growing there? Does that not look alive? Um, the Word of God gives life. We are born again by the living and abiding Word of God, Peter tells us. And so as we come to the Word of God this morning, we, and we set our eyes on Jesus and the cross it is for life. It is for life. We don't want to be stale. We don't want to be those whose lives are unfruitful. We don't want to be barren branches. And so we come to the Word this morning and ask that God would bear fruit in new life. Esther chapter 1. We'll read in a few moments. There are some mercies that God gives us through our lifetime which are so great We never get over them. You ever been there? Uh, Some mercies are just worth celebrating for the rest of our lives. And one example for our family in particular, and this is not new to most of you, but um, when our five-year-old daughter, who's now in college, when she had a medical neck injury that could have been life-altering, and God spared her and gave her a remarkable recovery, that's a mercy that is so great, we never stop celebrating that. Every year at Thanksgiving, by the way, which was, it was Thanksgiving morning when her whole medical journey began with the injury, every Thanksgiving we celebrate her life and her health and her wholeness. Some mercies are so good, we should never get over them. And of course, uh, The ultimate mercy is the cross of Jesus Christ as we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. That's exactly what we're doing. We're coming back to commemorate a mercy so great we should remember it often. We should never get over it. We should never forget. We should never let it become commonplace in our lives. For the Jews in the Old Testament, annual feasts were were a way of commemorating God's great mercy like Passover, which retold the story of God's deliverance of the people from, the, from, from Egypt, right? Their slavery in Egypt, their deliverance out of, out of slavery. Well, the story of Esther is also an account of God's great deliverance from wicked Haman's attempt to exterminate the Jews in the Persian Empire. And so great was God's deliverance in the days of Esther and Mordecai that an annual feast was established to celebrate that deliverance year after year. This is called the Feast of Purim. And in a couple months, when we get to the book of the end of the book of Esther, you'll understand why you'll understand why it's called the book of or the Feast of Purim. The, The book of Esther ends with the establishment of this feast, so as to say, what God has done is so good that you should not only not forget it. But you should live your life in light of a God who delivers like Yahweh delivers. The story of Esther is is a remarkable, remarkable testament to God's faithfulness. Well, every year at the Feast of Purim, the book of Esther would be read. That's part of the feast. The book of Esther would be read and It served not only as a remembrance of God's protection in the past, but also it served as a message of encouragement and hope for the people of God down through the ages that no matter how great or hostile their enemies may be, God is able to deliver. No king is ultimately in control. No earthly king. The Sovereign Lord is the only one who reigns supreme. And that is a hope that you can build your life on. Now, I need to give you a spoiler alert. Even though Esther is filled with a lot of suspense, 
uh, we're not going to wait till the end to see how the book of Esther turns out. It just doesn't work that way in the book of Esther. It's important for you to know the whole of the story in order to understand the full significance of its parts, including chapter 1. Uh, while there's a lot... To, you know, so, so the book of Esther is a little bit like a parable in a sense that the, the book as a whole, as a single unit, has one main message for us, okay? Now, that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of secondary lessons to be learned in the book of Esther. There are, and we will hopefully touch on a lot of those, but we don't want to miss the main point, even in chapter 1. So before we dive into chapter 1, let's take a moment. I didn't do this really last week when I introduced Esther, so I'm going to do it today. I'm going to try to give you the book of Esther in two minutes or less, Okay? I was able to do it in a minute and 45 seconds this week. I actually timed it. I want to be true to my word. I'm not running a timer right now, but let's see. I'm just going to give you the over, an overview of the book of Esther so that you can understand where the storyline's going as we unpack chapter 1. Okay, here we go. The book of Esther opens with King Ahasuerus, better known as King Xerxes. You'll remember that name from history, King Xerxes, ruling over the Persian Empire, largest empire of the day. At a great banquet, the king became intoxicated. He demanded his queen at the time, Queen Vashti, to come and, be, come and uh, display her beauty, but she refused to come. And when she refused to come, the king became so enraged that he banished her from the throne. Nice guy. The king then searched for a new queen by means of a beauty pageant. Esther, a Jewish girl who had been raised by her cousin Mordecai, was chosen to be the new queen however she did not inform anyone that she was a jew this is a secret she, they didn't know she was a jew the plot begins to thicken as mordecai discovers a plot to assassinate the king mordecai worked at the gate of the king he worked in, in the king's service he then informed esther who relayed the information on to the king the king's life was spared and about this time the king appoints haman one of his officials, to be in charge of the king's officials. However, Haman despised Mordecai because Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. This infuriated Haman so much that he, was, he convinced the king that the Jews were traitors and that he should sign a decree to exterminate the Jews. When Mordecai hears of the decree he, to annihilate the Jews, he, he appeals to Esther to come to their defense or perhaps God has raised her up for such a time as this. This is an extremely dangerous undertaking for Esther. But she approached the king. She exposed Haman's plot. And as a result, Haman was hanged on the very gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai on. And the Jewish people were saved. Now, the book closes with the establishment of the Feast of Purim to forever celebrate God's deliverance of his people through Esther and Mordecai. And through all the twists and turns, and there are a lot more in the story we didn't cover this morning. There's a lot of twists and turns in this story. God is at work to preserve and to deliver his people, not in the miraculous ways as he did in the days of bringing his people out of Egypt with great plagues and the, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. No, God is working more quietly, more subtly by His providence through the people and the circumstances in Esther's day in such a way that God's purposes would be established. So, the message of the book of Esther, as I have summarized it so far, is this. The providence of God is always working ensuring that his promises will be fulfilled to preserve and deliver his people through whom Christ would come to bring salvation to the world. And that last phrase there, through whom Christ would come, that's not in the book of Esther per se, but that's just putting Esther back in its proper context of the Bible story as a whole. What does Esther exist in the Bible storyline for? And it is to help us see how God is preserving the Jewish people through whom his Messiah would come. So how do we see God's providence unfold in chapter 1? As we move into that today, what we're about to see is that God is working through the circumstances and choices of a pagan king. 
his wife and his advisors to open a door of deliverance for God's people by putting Esther in just the right place at just the right time to represent God's people. So we're going to look at chapter 1 this morning under three kind of headings. We're going to see the royal splendor of King Ahasuerus. We're going to see the rebellious defiance of Queen Vashti. And we're going to see the ridiculous deflection of the king's folly. So hopefully that will all make sense by the time we get to the end of chapter 1 this morning. Okay, you ready? Let's begin with the royal splendor of King Ahasuerus. Chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read the first nine verses. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces... In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia, Media, and the nobles and the governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, a hundred and eighty days days when these days are completed the king gave for all the people present in susa the citadel both great and small a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace there were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of Porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. The purpose of these first nine verses is to make an emphatic statement about the power and the wealth of King Ahasuerus. This is done in several ways. We're going to track, we're going to track our way through here. First of all, we see the extent of his reign. This is massive. Verse 1 says, he is the, Hoa, the Ahasuerus <clears throat> who reigned from India to Ethiopia, which is today is modern-day Pakistan to Sudan. Not, not uh, India as we think of it as a continent, but it, it's a massive area. The largest known empire up to that time in history. And it's interesting that the author mentions the 127 provinces, rather than what they normally would do in those days, they would count the m- number of governors or satraps. And instead of, that was a much lower number, so instead of doing that, he records the number of provinces, and there's a point to why he does this. He's trying to impress us with how magnificent, how broad was the reign of this kingdom. Second, we see not only the extent of his reign, we see the expansiveness of this feast. Verses 3 and 4. This feast was a six-month gathering. Did you catch that? 180 days? It's ridiculous. Sounds ridiculous. Six-month gathering of all his officials and servants, his army and nobles, governors and prin- uh, of all the provinces. Verse 4 captures the heart of this, these first nine verses. He showed the riches of his glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. Now, it's hard to imagine the wealth that could support this kind of a party, right? I mean, this is is crazy. Why would he want to spend so much money on this? That's the question. (laughs) You maybe have money to waste. I mean, Persian kings were... We, they were amazingly wealthy. But w- why? Why would he do this? Well, when we do a little historical research, we discover that 
It was not out of a generous or a benevolent heart. That's not where we're going this morning. Okay? Nor was the Ahasuerus merely uh, a pompous king gloating in his glory. He is that, but there's more to the story than that. He was making strategic plans to expand his kingdom. This feast, with all his officials and nobles and army in the third year of his reign, so we know what year this is, it's in the third year of his reign, appears to be the war council of 483 B.C. 483 B.C. This is where he gathered all of his officials to make plans for his invasion of Greece. There's not just six months of partying. There's some planning going on. There's some strategizing going on. Ahasuerus is about ready to pounce on the Greeks. Ahasuerus' father, Darius, you remember Darius' name from the book of Daniel, right? His father had been, Darius had been defeated in his attempt to take Athens. And according to one historian of the day, Herodotus, Ahasuerus set his heart to avenge his father. I'm going to get the Greeks. They're going to fall under my reign. Vindicate my dad. So his great feast is not only to host all those needed to plan his military campaign, it's also a showing of his wealth and the greatness of his kingdom to instill confidence in their king and loyalty to his cause. When you're an empire going up against another empire, you're asking for a lot of blood. You're asking for a lot of sacrifice. You're asking for a lot of demands. And he wants to demonstrate we have the power to be victorious. We've got it. Look at me. Look at me. You're a great leader. Third. The third way we see the magnificence, the splendor, the pomp of his reign is that we, we see the royal splendor of the king and the extravagance of the venue and the decor which is recorded here. This is unusual. Other than the building of the temple, it's kind of unusual. The great 180-day feast is swallowed up by, uh, excuse me, is followed up by another seven-day feast for everyone in the capital city of Susa, everyone both great and small. Notice that. So this encompasses the whole city. Perhaps this banquet was, was pro- it's probably the grand finale to those six months. Like, They've had their six months, he's been feeding everybody, they've been doing all their war planning, and now at the end of the, we're going to have a big, big blowout banquet for seven days. Just to show you how much we got to work with here, right? According to verse 5, this banquet was held in the court of the garden of the king's palace, which must have been immense, it had to have been immense. Verses 6 and 7 detail how this court was staged with extravagant curtains and marble pillars and couches of gold and silver on a floor of precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels and wine was in abundant supply. I mean, he's showing off how much he's got. In fact, later, um, okay, spoiler alert, he didn't do so well against the Greeks. Uh, That kind of is undermining my point right now about his greatness, but... um, when, when the Greeks finally were able to come back and pounce on the Persians a bit, they were so impressed with the wealth of the Persian kings that they said, why'd they ever want to try and take over us, poor Greeks? They had way, more, way more to themselves. It's kind of, kind of ironic. It's amazing where pride will take you. This leads to the fourth way the king's wealth is displayed in the excessiveness of the drinking at the party. Historians tell us that there was a law in Persia that when, a king, when the king drank, everyone present drank also. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> but on this occasion, verse 8 tells us that the edict was issued that every man was free to drink as he desired. You don't have to drink when the tr- king drinks. But do you think this was issued because people didn't want to drink very much at this party? I don't think so. No, no. The reality is, he's giving freedom for them to drink however they want to, as much as they want to, whenever they want to. You don't have to wait for the king to drink. Again, he's showing off. About, this is all in the king's tab, by the way. Just going on to show off how much he's got to work with. It also, by the way, demonstrates the level of meticulous control that the king of Persia had. 
I'll decide when you drink, when you don't drink, or when you get to drink freely. Don't miss that, okay? Now, if the extent of his reign, 127 provinces, the expansiveness of the feast, 180 days, the extravagance of his courtyard and uh, his decor and the excessiveness of the wine is not enough to demonstrate the immense wealth and pomp and the grandeur of King, the king of Persia. Verse 9 also mentions that Queen Vashti hosted a banquet for the women in the palace, which must have been immense as well. So here we are left with this stunning, almost sickening picture of overwhelming wealth and greatness and pomp and kingly glory. Verses 1 through 9 are meant to leave the impression that King Ahasuerus was incomparable among the kings of the earth. That's the point that we're supposed to see here. Wealth, power, greatness, certainly certainly no one could stand in his way or challenge his authority, right? (laughs) But that's about to be tested. And that brings us to the second part of our text this morning, the, the rebellious defiance of Queen Vashti. Let's read now beginning with verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, don't miss that, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, what a great name, Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. I want you to notice this morning that this took place on the seventh day of the the final feast, right? After seven intense days of drinking, right? Right? The king himself was merry with wine. And by the way, if this seems a little strange to you, one historian tells us that the Persians' custom was to deliberate on serious matters when they drank because they believed that they were more in touch with the spiritual world when they were intoxicated. So (laughs) this is literally what what the historians tell us they would do. They would have these discussions, make decisions while they're drinking, And then the next day when they were sober, they'd reevaluate their decisions to see if they still thought they were good. And if they're good, they'd go forward with them. If they didn't think so, then they'd start drinking again. I mean, it seems ridiculous to us, right? But they were doing. And it's in his intoxicated state that the king makes a demand of his wife to come and entertain, entertain the other drinking men with her beauty. Now, it's been suggested by almost everybody who's ever written anything on the book of Esther, most everybody, that this is about the showing of her beauty with some sense of lewdness. In some way, it would be inappropriate. Some way that would stain her honor for the rest of her life, basically, right? I mean, that's 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 what we, we kind of assume that here. At any rate, it is certainly hard to assume that the king had pure and honorable intentions in his intoxicated state. He was probably not focused on displaying the queen's honor, that's probably not what's going on here, but rather using her as a means of his own bragging rights. This is one more way for him to show off that he's got everything, including, you know, the best, the most beautiful queen around. By showing off his, may I use the term, trophy wife, Hashuerus reveals his presumption that she exists only to serve his purposes. Okay? I mean, this is pagan and wicked to the core. We're going to see throughout chapter 1, it should be kind of obvious to us that he doesn't have any deep respect or love for women in his life. He's using them. Verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. Now it's hard not to be sympathetic here toward the queen, isn't it? I mean, take note that the text, however, does not give us the actual reason for her refusal. It doesn't tell us that she was justified because 
she didn't want to violate her honor and that and that may be the case but it doesn't tell us that we don't know exactly what his intentions were we don't know exactly what her reasons were we're just told matter of factly she refused to come why why is it not made clear in the text well because the point of the text is not whether the queen's defiance was justified or not that's not what the author is concerned about at this point Rather, the author seems to have a threefold purpose in light of the book of Esther. Number one, to provide an explanation of how a vacancy of the queen occurred for Esther to fill. It's background information, background material, okay? Here's how we got to this point. Number two, to suggest that Hashuerus' authority may not be as absolute as it seems. There's a hint here, right? And thirdly, to suggest that Ahasuerus, excuse me, to show how thin the ice could be under the queen's feet in the palace. She doesn't have any particular, apparently, doesn't have any particular rights or authority, not, not, not in the, as far as the king goes. As we're going to see how quickly she's dismissed, it's going to help us see, looking down the road here in the book of Esther, just how risky it really was for Esther to take the steps she did on behalf of God's people. You can only imagine how embarrassing this must have been for King Ahasuerus, right? I mean, think about this. He, he's defined by the queen in front of all his nobles and army while seeking to garner their support for battle. Ooh, this cuts deep. <laughs> She just shattered his pride. He's asking for loyalty to the point of death and yet can't command the loyalty of his wife? I mean, this doesn't sit well with the crowd. Not in his day. His authority has been challenged in the most humiliating way possible for a king of an empire like his. So it's not surprising to read in verse 12 that the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. He's intoxicated and he's ticked off. Not a good combination, right? The question is, how will enraged Ahasuerus react to such defiance and embarrassment? Well, this leads to the final portion of our text this morning. We're going to see the ridiculous deflection of the king's folly. Begin reading in verse 13. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshina, Shethar, Abmatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marcina, and Memukin, the seven princes of Persia, Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in his kingdom. Pause. These boys are a big deal. They're the only seven men who have this kind of access to the king. They're his advisors. He listens to them. And they get to sit and have intimate conversation with the king on a regular basis. Big deal. And the king says to these seven men, According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Notice the formal language here. What's to be done with Queen Vashti because she's not obeyed? He's talking about himself. King Ahasuerus. Very formal, right? Not much humility in this statement. Verse 16, then Memukin said in the presence of the king and his officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. Woo. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, casting them, excuse me, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him. She did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better 
than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands high and low alike. This this advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and every people in his own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. Let me, permit me to make several observations from these verses we just read, okay? And then we'll put it together. Number one, Hashuerus does not handle this situation personally. Did you notice that? He turns immediately to his legal advisors for what to do with his wife, the queen. Can you see how this objectifies the queen as a mere servant or a piece of property rather than a prized wife? You see that? Furthermore, it demonstrates that the most powerful man in the world is incompetent in handling a conflict with his own wife. Take note of that. Number two, Hashuerus is not a man of conscience or conviction or principle. He's rather fickle. He's he's, uh, impulsive and he's fickle. In a moment, he goes from wanting everyone to see his wife to never wanting to see her again. Third, his advisor, Memucan. Memucan's response is crafty, it is manipulative, and it's full of exaggeration. This guy is a slick politician, if ever I've seen one. Now, while it's true, it is true that One in leadership or a high-profile position like a queen is influential in terms of their example. What Memucan does here is blow the situation completely out of proportion. And theologians, I mean, not theologians, excuse me. Well, politicians love to do this, right? Politicians love to blow things out of proportion. Six times he uses the word all to suggest that this one refusal of the queen will result in an empire-wide rebellion of wives against their husbands. The whole social order of the Persian Empire is going to come crashing down because she said no to a bad request of the king. (laughs) And in doing this, Memucan, here's what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. There's always a story beneath the story, isn't there? He's deflecting the king's foolish demand of his wife to entertain all his drunken male guests. He's deflecting the king's folly away from him by overshadowing it with the supposed immensity of Vashti's offense against the whole social order of the entire kingdom. In other words, we'll make what she did look so bad that we'll kind of forget what he did over here. And by doing this, Memucan is attempting to justify the king's anger. In other words, oh king, you have the right to be so angry because her actions have such grievous and far-reaching and destructive implications. You follow me? There's a life principle here. The life principle is Human beings are prone to magnifying someone else's offense in order to minimize or justify their own offense. Happens every day in every city of the world. I'm going to make such a big deal out of your offense that mine doesn't seem that... That's why Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye first, then deal with the speck in your brother's eye. You know why? Because God is not deceived by our manipulative efforts, is he? Now, can you see how Memucan's advice is not only flattering the, to the king, but it's also self-serving at this point. <laughs> By seeking to justify the king's anger, Memucan is avoiding the uncomfortable position of having to address the king's folly. And as we're seeing here in chapter 1, to challenge the king does not lead to favorable results. 
Samemekin comes up with this slick plan to make the king look right and good in what he's doing so he didn't have to deal with being on the raw side of the king. Wow. What human beings are capable of, right? Here's a life principle. Don't surround yourself with those who merely agree with you or even exaggerate how you've been wronged by someone else. And yet, don't address where you have been wrong in dealing with others. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, what? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. The best friend you can have is a friend who will tell you the truth even when it hurts and even when it makes you mad. That's a true friend. And you're blessed if you have one. If you don't have one, go find one. You need them. You need them. The fourth observation I want us to see in these verses is that just notice the irony <laughs> that this superpower of Persia is holding a war council to invade Greece, yet Memucan is sowing fear into the king's heart of an entire empire-wide rebellion based on one woman's no to a bad situation. <laughs> they had a war council of all things. But oh no, what's going to bring us down is not the Greeks, but your wife. There, there is some humor in the book of Esther, by the way. I'll explain that later, why, why, why we should see some humor in the book of Esther. Number five, when Memucan says in verse 19, give her royal position to another who is better than she, there, there's a sense here in which he is speaking better than he knows. But what he's really saying, what's Memucan saying? What, what does Memucan mean? He means probably one who is more obedient than Vashti. Again, just like, there's no regard for how a man should necessarily treat a woman. And yet he speaks better than he knows, for Esther will prove to be truly influential before the king as she seeks to reverse the king's edict against God's people. She, by God's hand, will be the real influential one here in the story of Esther. Number six. There seems to be an, an assumption based on verses 20 and 22 that respect and honor and loyalty in the home can be legislated. Look at this. Look at verse 20. When a decree is made by the king, proclaimed through all the kingdom, for it is vast, all women will honor their husbands, high and low. Can you just imagine the president or the senate of the United States passing a law that says, okay, children, obey your parents. Oh, it's all going to be fixed now. I mean, this is so short-sighted and it's so arrogant to think that they can legislate how relationships work in the home. And you've got to say, well, there's some truth to the fact that husbands should lead their families with God-given and God-fearing authority. But that's not the focal point here. That's not where Memucan's going at all. He didn't care at all about God's design for the family. Memucan rather is proposing domination by force of legislation that's what he's talking about he's trying to use this situation there's lots of other bible texts we can go to to talk about um, leadership in the home but this text is about not that this text is about the overreach of the king's authority and apparently ahasuerus and his boys falsely believed that respect could be demanded even when it wasn't deserved now, that doesn't mean we don't respect people only when they earn our respect. We should respect all people to decree because they're image bearers of God and because we have respectable character, and so we respect out of respectable character. But you can't go around demanding respect by living a disrespectful life. Number seven, perhaps the greatest irony is that Memukin's proposal was based on the fear that the queen's behavior will be made known to all women. Now this, okay, this is where we see a little humor in the book of Esther. We better not let this get out to people that she can get away with this. So what do they do? <laughs> the decree itself accomplished the very thing they're trying to prevent. They publish a bulletin about the queen's defiance of the king and they write it in every language of the kingdom and send it to every corner of the empire. 
right? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Perhaps now you can see why I referred to this deflection of the king's foolish demand of the queen as ridiculous. It demonstrates the incompetence of the king's advisors in accomplishing the very thing they were trying to avoid as they attempt to cover up the king's incompetence to, honor, to be able to honorably lead his wife. In their wisdom, they counsel the king to publish the very thing he's trying to cover up. He publishes his own embarrassment. Wow. Now, I want you to stop for a minute and think about this. If this was in our day, and political cartoonists were alive and well, what do you think they'd do with this story at this point? Oh, they would love it. They would make King Ahasuerus, the, the Greeks, for example, they'd make King Ahasuerus look like a bumbling fool. This guy thinks he's great. He's an idiot. That's, that's what they would be doing, right? And there, there's a sense of this that, like, there are times in war when we use humor to bring down fear, right? And there is there's a sense in which perhaps the book of Esther kind of does that, like, Remember, this is reminding the Jews throughout the ages that no matter how big and powerful and vicious your enemies are, they're not as powerful as they think they are. They're not as wise and cunning as they think they are. They are no competition for the hand of God. And so through the, through the uh, years at Purim, I could imagine the Jews getting to the end of chapter 1 and chuckling a little bit about King Ahasuerus, this great, pompous, rich, wealthy leader of, a, of, the, of the empire of the world, listening to foolish advisors and embarrassing himself on the world stage. So, what does the author of Esther want us to see in chapter 1? Well, verses 1 through 9, the first nine verses, are meant to leave the reader thinking, certainly if anyone is in control, it's King Ahasuerus. <laughs> He's a big deal. He's got wealth and power, a world empire at his command. Yet by the end of chapter 1, we see just how incompetent Ahasuerus actually is. The irony that he controls 127 provinces, but he can't control his queen. He can't control his wife. Do you see the irony there? He's one of the most powerful men on the earth and yet too weak to reign in his own temper. You see that? Men, take note of this. And read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs has a lot to say about reigning in our tempers. It's better to reign in your temper than to take down a city, the book of Proverbs tells us. Right? That's, that's where true strength and victory is found. He's surrounded by the wise men of earth whose counsel is what? Foolish. It's foolish. Perhaps the most powerful men on earth are not as powerful as they appear to be. And so there's a, there's a sense in which we, we sit back, we chuckle a little bit, perhaps at the end of chapter 1. Such a powerful, ruthless man is little more than a bumbling fool. Now remember, this story was read every year at Purim, right? It's a reminder to God's people those who seem so powerful are not as powerful as they seem. Their threats may be real. Their threats may be real. But they are fools who cannot outmaneuver the unseen hand of God. That's what we're going to see throughout the book of Esther. Now let me suggest several ways we can be encouraged as we meditate on Esther chapter 1. Number one, while there's real danger in opposing the powers that be in this world, we must not take the power and the glory of this world too seriously. I'm not trying to minimize the wickedness and the evil and the danger of godless men, any men with absolute power. I'm not minimizing that what, one bit. But no mere mortal has the final say over our lives or over the events of history. That's the truth. 
Isaiah chapter 2 says it really well. The proud look of man will be abased in the, and, and the loftiness of man will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. He's always one breath away from death. Stop regarding man, for why should he be esteemed? In other words, stop fearing man and walk in the fear of God alone. That's a pretty powerful takeaway from Esther chapter 1. Secondly, the choices and actions of men, regardless of how foolish or wicked, cannot thwart God's purposes from being fulfilled. Psalm 2 captures this so well. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Think about the Jewish people here, right? Saying, let us tear their fetters apart. But then Psalm 2 says, He who sits in the heavens, what does he do? Laughs. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. So lest you thought I was being sacrilegious when I talked about chuckling at the end of chapter 1, the Lord sits in the heavens and He says, you think that you guys who go to the G7 summit have power and control? You're not in charge. You're not in charge. I will determine the outcome. Plan whatever you want. Scheme whatever you want. Put whatever resources into it you've got. I will determine the outcome. Third. And this, I hope, you just hide this in your heart. For every day of your life. Before we are even aware of the coming crisis, God is at work by His providence to make a way through it. Church, do you, do you hear me? Before we even know the crisis is coming, we can't even see it on the horizon yet. God is at work for our good. In chapter 1, the Jews in Persia had no inclination that God was working on their behalf. They didn't even know what wicked Haman had in his heart or what would be, be in his heart. They had no idea. I mean, they're, they're, they're in a position where like, they're going back to the promised land. There have been three waves of Jews who have already gone back. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. They're rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. This does not seem like the most threatening season of life. And it's about to be. But already now in chapter 1, before the crisis comes, God is at work by His providence, working through a drunk king, a defiant queen, to demonstrate that He's in control and His people will not be snatched out of His hand. Yeah. So we can say with confidence, church, when we come into a crisis, Anybody in a crisis right now? You don't have to raise your hand, but if you're in a crisis, when we come to a crisis, God knew all along that this situation was going to happen. So I can be confident He's planning to help me through it. The next time, the next, this week, if you face a cri financial situation, a health crisis, whatever it is, a relationship crisis, long before I could have known about this situation coming god knew about it he knows all things he's providentially working has his hand in all things and if god was not taken by surprise i can trust him to walk me to the other side as we come to the lord's table this morning how does esther one relate to christ as the ultimate climax of the big storyline of the bible well, first, it reminds us that every earthly king is inadequate. Everyone. There's only one who is all-powerful. Only one who is, whose reign is truly wholesome. Only one who alone possesses infinite wisdom. And that is Jesus Christ, 
who would wield his power and control how? Well, self-sacrifice for the salvation of his people. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. He's also the King of kings and the Lord of lords who will rule this earth with a rod of iron. He'll bring all wickedness, all rebellion to its knees. But he's a king who first sacrifices on behalf of his people for their rescue. And when we defied the great king of heaven, rather than being forever banished from his sight like Vashti, we were restored to his presence as the king himself laid down his life to deliver us from our rebellion. Why? To present us before him spotless, pure and spotless before his throne. And so this morning as we come before the Lord, come to the Lord's table, we come not only forsaking our sin, yes we do that. We also come though with grateful hearts of worship, bowing before King Jesus as the only sovereign worthy to reign over our lives with absolute authority. So I want to invite you this morning these moments Quiet your heart before the Lord. And ask yourself this morning, is Jesus reigning supremely in my life? Or is there rebellion in the palace? We don't know if Queen Vashti's rebellion was precisely justified. But we know ours isn't. So I invite you this morning to be reminded Jesus does have not only the authority to reign over our lives supremely. He, he, has, he has the right to tell us what is good and what is bad, what is righteous and what is judgment worthy. He doesn't come to us just as a demanding king comes to us laying down his life for those he loves. In these moments this morning, will you, will you open your heart? Will you allow Jesus, the King of Heaven, the highest and the most humble, to love you and to serve you with the sacrifice of his life? There's not a one of us who can stand before a holy God, pure and blameless. But Jesus can. He's offered to do it this morning on your behalf. If you will trust in Him, if you'll submit to His rule and reign as Lord, and discover He alone gives life. Let's take some moments to pray as the men pass out the communion elements and we'll worship together.